Meet my dad, Richard Shank. This was a self-portrait taken in 1978 when he was 38 years old. Um, he can't be here to in, in body to tell you this story because he died about 18 months ago at age 71. But he does have an important story to tell. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the story, and then he's going to finish it. So when my dad died about a year and a half ago, as I said, my two brothers and I went to Colorado to clean out his stuff, and uh, we found the usual suits and books and shaving brushes and, and all that stuff, and there was a lot to go through. And we found two things that really rose above everything else uh, of just extraordinary importance to us. One was a surprise, one was not a surprise. The, the surprise was that we found, buried in, deep in a box, we found a journal that he had written, very, very personal journal. He'd written in 1978 when this photograph uh, was taken, uh, that he, when he took it of himself. And uh, it, it was talking about, uh, the journal's all about how he's a middle-aged man, and uh, he hasn't done anything exceptional in his life. He's an ordinary man, and he wants to be extraordinary. And he's chosen his vehicle for doing that. He wants to become a photographer. He wants to develop a way of seeing through a camera lens that no one has ever done before. He wants to have his peculiar, particular voice through his, through his camera. And he's brand new to, 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 uh, to photography, but he has this incredible ambition to, to do this. And he you know, buys a couple cameras and takes some pictures and builds a rudimentary darkroom and starts to learn how to develop and all that. Takes a, a couple, it takes a master class. But really early on, in, in, in his journal is documenting this, he knew what he really had to do, and that is make the pilgrimage out to uh, the West Coast, to, to California, to Carmel, both to take pictures in this uh, very exotic place of rocks and seaweed and beautiful light, and also to try to meet his great photographer hero, Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams is the, you know, the rock star of photography, and he, he thought, if I can go and meet Ansel Adams and tell him what I want to do and, and just get a few words of encouragement, um, you know, I, that's, that'll be, that'll be the, that's my launching pad. That's how to do that. So he, so he did that. He actually went out west and he, and he took his, his early photographs and he met Ansel Adams. And Ansel Adams welcomed him into his, his, uh, his, his office suite and he looked at his, at his pictures and he gave him really encouraging words and it was enough to, to do exactly what he hoped. I, I, I've been thinking about the story and wondering what the analog would be for me. And the closest I can come to is, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a rock band, and uh, I think I'm going to drive up to New Jersey and uh, I'm gonna knock on Bruce Springsteen's house, and let's see if he, you know, hears some of my early songs and says, yeah, keep going. I mean, it was that, it was that huge a thing for, for my dad as a photographer. And uh, he spent the next 33 years taking every scrap of free time that he had, first while he was working, uh, making a living, and then in retirement, trying to create his own vision of things. And he traveled the world. He traveled uh, all around the country. He did urban scenes and rural scenes. He would, whenever we were with him, uh, we would always be incredibly embarrassed because he would stop people and, and say, can I photograph you? And as a young kid, you're, when your dad is doing that to people, it's just like, oh, let me, just please let me vanish from the earth. But he, he did that over and over. Whenever he saw a face that to him was interesting, he wanted to put it through his own you know, particular lens and, and show the rest of the world how he was looking at that face. And when he was back home, he spent every, every waking moment in his dark room. And this was really one of the things, one of the beautiful things he gave to, to all three of us, my, myself and my two brothers, because we got to spend time in the dark room with him. I mean, many, many hours of time. And for those of you who haven't spent time in a dark room, it's a magical place. The lights are out. And you see this beam of light coming down from the enlarger onto a blank piece of paper. And then you take the piece of paper in the dark to the developer bath, and you rock it back and forth, and you have to be really patient. You can't jump the gun. And then you move the paper to the stop bath, and then you move it to the fixer bath. And then finally, you can turn on the lights. And my dad would look at the image, and he had this real funny kind of headset that, that would give him, had a magnifying glass on it. And he would. Uh, 
look at it real closely and we're like, wow, this is magic. You just created an image out of nothing. And he would be like, well, look at all these imperfections. Look how the, the contrast isn't right. Look, you know, we can do better. And so he would go back and he'd do the same thing over and over again with the same image until he was satisfied. And sometimes he was never satisfied. And when he had something that he was satisfied with, he'd, he'd print it on a mounting board like this and put it in a box like this. And over the years, we got to see uh, you know, many of his photographs, and, and we're, we're, we thought he was great. You know, as kids, we, we thought he was a wonderful, and it was inspiring to, to see this creative process. And by the way, no surprise, all three of us have gone on to, be on, to become creative, uh, create, to, to pursue creative endeavors, two of us as writers and one as a filmmaker. So he did this for, for 33 years. His life uh, ended shorter than, it, than it, it should have through an accident. And, um, and now he's, he's gone, and, and we're, we're in his uh, office in his dark room, you know, looking through his stuff. And, um, and I'm feeling two emotions simultaneously. I'm feeling really sad that I lost my dad, and I st still miss him at this moment more than, you know, as much as I missed him the moment I heard that he died. But I also felt sad for him. I felt, I felt a little sorry for him because he had spent 33 years pursuing this grand ambition to be you know, the next Ansel Adams. And there's no one in this room who's heard of Richard Shank, the photographer. He, he, he died um, far less than famous, barely, barely known. Um, he self-published his own book, and it didn't sell. And um, he tried to get his stuff in galleries, and he did a couple times, but it didn't, again, it didn't really sell. He was not able to attract attention. One of the reasons was that he wouldn't take uh, criticism, and, and for a long time we thought, well, that was a weakness of his. If he'd just listened on how to make his work more commercial or you know, more accessible, um, maybe he could have been uh, famous and enjoyed, enjoyed some fame. Uh, and, that's, and that's what I thought when he died, I, and I felt sorry for him because, frankly, I have achieved a, a little bit of success. Both of my brothers have, too, and so we've, we've learned how to kind of be in that middle ground of being creative but also working towards your audience and being, being keenly aware of what that audience is. So the second thing that my dad left for us was a, uh, in, a, in a small concrete room. It was 142 boxes like this. 3,000 photographs. And as I said, I'd seen a lot over the years, but I hadn't seen you know, anything like anything close to all of them. A couple months went by, and we had to deal with all sorts of crazy estate Michigas. And then we got to open the boxes. And immediately, immediately, I knew that I was all wrong about my dad. He was a truly great artist. And yeah, it's sad that he died before he got discovered. But in the scheme of things, I don't know that that matters very much because he did the thing that he wanted to do. He spent a lifetime pursuing his own vision, not letting anyone else inside that vision, developing his own way of seeing things, and making the art that he wanted to make. And I look at these images now, and I don't feel sorry for my dad. I feel like my dad is still talking to me. He's gone, but he's still being my dad. He's talking to me as a creative person. He's saying, look what happens when a man at middle age, decides to stop being ordinary and to stop listening to other voices and paying attention to how everyone else sees the world and decides that he's only going to look at it through his own lens. Amazing things can happen. And 
I don't know if you feel my dad speaking to you or not, but now I'm middle age and I certainly feel like he's speaking to me through these images and the message is coming in loud and clear. And I want to thank him for this and to share these images with you. And there's just a few more here. I could show you all 3,000, but it would take a couple of days. We have to get to this one, of course. That's me. And I have to embarrass my brothers. That's my brothers. Thanks so much for listening.